Yeah. What? We're not ready? We're recording. You're live. We are recording. I am live. Look at me over the thing. Okay. So here we are. It's November. Jeremy Foster uh, uh, had an unexpected uh, conflict. So fortunately, Brian had approached me just, what, a month before that? Maybe a month and a half? I didn't even think it was that. that was and, uh, and said, hey, is there a chance I could show off some Netduino stuff this year? And I said, well, gosh, it's not looking good, but if somebody cancels, I'll let you know. And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that's, that's as tender as it can be there, can't, isn't it? Um, it's as brittle so, as everything else we have set up here. <laughs> so we're hacking it together tonight. That's Let's right. go for it. Woo! Oh, right, right. Uh, microphone. Oh, sorry. yeah, microphone. we got to record him, too. We are recording him. We are not streaming him tonight. So anyone watching on streaming? Right, you can't because you're not there. Is that green flicker? That's the screen. This screen, isn't it? It's not up here, right? right. Got it. I remember that now. It's it's been a month. I forget things. Is this on already? Or yes. do it? Okay. <clears throat> okay. Test, test, Microsoft. Test, the reason we're here. Test. Intel provides a great spot. Thank you again, Darren. Sure Web provides our web space uh, out there. Thirsty Lion. We've got gift cards. Not Amelia's. We have gift cards. Y'all notice that we went back to the uh, non Amelia's tonight? Anyone? Yes. Anyone shocked? What's it like inside of there now? Non Amelia's? Have you been in? It is spiffy. So if if y'all recall, non Amelia's was going through a remodel last month, and they completed that. It doesn't look dramatically different, and that's good because they have a very interesting character about that restaurant. But it, they clean places that could never be reached on a normal day. So so it is really nice. They got new paint, uh, new carpet. Etc. Etc. We're going back here. Yeah, we're going back. That may be working. It may not yet. It might be a few minutes. Think, seeing that, Danielle? Okay. Tracy believes she did it correctly. She's not in the audience to check. So good. Here we go. Finally, uh, we have uh, JetBrains licenses, and we have beer. <laughs> if you take the beer, we want to see your ID. <laughs> There's at least, what, two, three, four people who can't have the beer. <laughs> oh, I saw you looking. I got it. <laughs> no, they can't. They can't. We don't want them touching. It's questionable whether we can have the beer here, James. So let's do it. Hey, cool. Wi Fi is working now. It is. Yes. Tracy, you awesome person. You. Tracy gets something for this. Maybe a beer. I don't know. <laughs> so, not these beers, though. Uh, also, we have New Relic as a sponsor. I believe someone's around from New Relic tonight. Did I hear the word New Relic? Matt, I, Matt said he wasn't making it. I thought he sent someone in his stand. Um, he's not available tonight. Vander Hallen. I haven't seen Andrew or anyone. No? Oh, that's what he was saying. Andrew wasn't going to make it either. I get it. Matt sent me a text message, and that's what he was talking about. Okay. That's weird. Really weird. So I would say um, so anyone else in that role probably should uh, take advantage of that. Uh, Droit Resources, we don't usually see them. Uh, Soft Source, that's sort of me. We are not currently hiring because uh, we have some people on bench right now. But if all of the things happen that I fully expect to happen, we will be needing people in the next couple of months. So keep your ear open for that. And by the way, as some people may know, we are also a good resource if you, if you need to have some uh, work done. Home Depot Quote Center. Anyone? Man, this is practically a sponsorless uh, meeting. We got, I know we got at least two or th I think I've seen three actually. Is that correct? Tech Systems, yes. Yes, you are. <laughs> um, Woo! Every time. Um, good to see everybody. A lot of faces I know, a few I don't. Um, we are still making a pretty hard push for the end of the year. Um, we've got a lot of open positions that are moving very quickly. Um, anything from DevOps to .NET to data. So um, I will be at the after party. Um, we always make it worth your while to come and say hello, so um, I will see you all later. Thank you. Uh, Robert Half, Steve, I think I see. You know, I realize your t-shirt 
not only is cool in a new sense, but oh, we've, been, we've, we've been uh, get, catching up on our Stranger Things, and it just takes me back to the era that way, too. <laughs> Hi everybody, I'm Stephen of Robert Half Technology. Uh, Robert Half is the oldest and largest <coughs> company in the world. Um, and we're always looking for new, uh, new people to come on board uh, with our clients. We've got an exclusive client right now that's looking just for people with heavy cloud and scripting background with some IT infrastructure, which is great. Other than that, I need some pretty talented project managers and uh, front end developers going forward. So, um, if you're one of those people, come say hi. If not, come say hi anyways, and we'll be at the first line of Thank you very much. Uh, IT Motive, says it's Alina or Angelo tonight? Angelo, he's here. Yeah, but he doesn't have a cool t-shirt like he does. Yeah, but I got a cool scarf. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a nice so, scarf. Angelo Seminary, IT Motives. We do have Alina in the house. <laughs> Woo! The Sconiers. We just came off the busy, busiest summer we've ever had in 10 years. Fall's looking the same. My tip is, hey, if you're at all in the market and you really are motivated to do something different, don't shut it down during the holidays if you can help it because you'll stand out. You'll stand out above the crowd. We'll be at the after hours. I don't know how long I'll be there. I think Alina will be there for a little while. And uh, yeah, thank you, Rich. Thank you very much. Uh, I believe I have one or more people in the audience that would like to uh, say some Stephanie. Let's start with you. I would like to say something. Hi, um, my name is Stephanie and I run a small software company. We do nonprofit software and we're looking for a full stack developer to join the team, kind of like visionary lead. It's very heavy back end. Um, but if you I will be after hours and if you'd like to know more, please come in and talk to me. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. <coughs> That's where the beer came from. Um, Luke, thank you. Oh, there you are. Yeah, I'm over here. You had a jacket on earlier. That's what. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Hey, my name is Luke Hammer. I work for a company called Curry Brown, uh, part of a small embedded software team. Essentially, we got a job. I'm, I'm trying to hire my boss, and we work for Tesla. If you want to know any more details about <laughs> that, come talk with me. We're hiring like right away, um, and I'll be around. How easy is it to boss you around? Oh. <laughs> Very difficult, I'm guessing. So, and that's a good thing. All right. Anyone else have anything they want to mention while we're while we're in this phase? Going once, twice, third time, gone. November eighth, Squad. Anyone know what's going on in Squad this month? That goes on a regular. I mean, I, some of y'all might go. I <laughs> always worry that none of the developers go to the quality assurance group. But okay. <laughs> I don't eat there all the time, so there you go. Uh, Portland Mobile, November 15th. That's the Xamarin Group. Did you ever go to that? No, I, I never did, actually. <laughs> I don't know. If it, some people may know Brian did once work for a Xamarin, and, uh, but he's a little farther out. He's a, in the Mount Hood division of, of Xamarin when he was that's there. That's right. That's so, right. <laughs> it's gorgeous, by the way, up that way. Uh, it's not bad. Yeah. Agile PDX, that's coming November 15th also. We've got Padnug West Side uh, Geek Dinner on the 21st. I made the reservation today, so it's there. It's pretty close to Thanksgiving, so it might be good to blow off a little steam before the whole family attacks your house. November 28th is the East Side uh, Geek Dinner. We're still open to the possibility of bowling if anyone's interested in that. Portland TypeScript on the 24th. Have you got some thoughts on that yet? Uh, we'll be announcing our speakers within the week. Uh, and we're meeting on the west side. So Woo! Short screen. Yeah, yeah. Near 185th and Walker Road. Yeah. Really great. If you've never been in there before, it's worth just coming. Just There's a out the beautiful Whole Foods near there, too, with an amazing know. cheesemonger. So if you want to do your grocery shopping before or after our meeting. <laughs> Some people may know my girlfriend works there. Too, so if you, if you oh. want to. Yeah, it was funny. Last month, Luke just walks up the stairs. And he's like, oh, is the meetup starting? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> nice. No. I, I think we're probably the only two tech, uh, pure tech companies in that building. And so it's, no, he's I guess, talking about I guess so. I guess Tectronics. Yes, I did not that, but he's talking about Tectronics campus. Long, oh, no. Yeah, no. No, no, I think you guys are in different. I think they're in a different building. Than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. So um, then December 5th, Padnug, the, the boring one for December. Is, has everyone done a December Padnug? Anyone? Who has it? Maybe it's a better way to say it. Who is that? Man, you guys are in for a treat. Scott Haswell's <laughs> bringing presents for all of us? Is that yes, he's bringing presents. Is it over Jeff? Or is it presents? Oh, okay, yes, JFCC. JFCC. 
nice, nice, nice try though. Um, I haven't decided. We're working on it. There's really cool um, VR systems available this year. There's also some X something, I don't know. One or both of those will be on the uh, uh, treat list this year. And then, uh, of course, Scott Hanselman. And I'm already pinged Lola about the Qdoba order, so we'll, we'll have a good time. We'd like to see a top 300 this year. We were at 285 last year. Wouldn't that be cool to say we got 300 this year? So tell all your friends, bring the kids. You got that? <laughs> Woo! Kids are awesome. How do you fit them all in here? You're different. Ah, yes, JFCC. Oh, okay. They got, they got about 480-some seats over there. Gotcha. Yeah, works better for that. Very cool. <laughs> Bring Lindsay. Yeah. Okay. December 7th, Portland SQL Server user group. December 19th and 26th, another round of geek dinners, and yippee ki -yay, we're almost done. Afterwards, Thirsty Lion, please throw your hand up in the air if you think you'll be joining us. Kids, you can go, too. You can't. It'll be totally. Aww. But well, the kids could still go, even well, if it's your bedtime. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Excellent. Well, with no further ado, Brian, thank you for coming in and a little bit of a last minute. Yeah, the absolutely. last week or so. Absolutely, awesome. absolutely. It's been fun scrambling to get this talk together. <laughs>
imagine that, right? Turn on the coffee maker and it gets warm. So uh, here's my, my coffee maker, and um, this is the setup that I've got going on here is a Netduino 3 uh, Wi-Fi model, and then there's just a little breadboard here to hook things together, and then this is a, uh, this is a relay, which I'll talk about in a moment. And um, this is a repurposed uh, phone charger, a USB phone charger, so I can run my, I can uh, unplug my Netduino from my computer, I can plug it into my phone charger, and I can set this on my counter, and then I have my, uh, my, my kind of dumb smart uh, coffee maker. And uh, I'm going to walk through kind of the different pieces of this. It's, there's, uh, there's several moving pieces. There's uh, the, the hardware setup. There is the, um, the uh, control uh, that, that Netduino is doing and web server where I'm exposing an API that I'm talking to uh, from my, um, my Xamarin app. And then, of course, there's a Xamarin app which talks to uh, that web API. Uh, so it's it's kind of uh, the scenario here is kind of fun because I'm I'm putting together a lot of like a lot of different pieces of technology. You know, we've got the hardware, we've got uh, we've got the um, the Netduino running .NET Micro Framework, and then we've got uh, a mobile app running Xamarin. It's you know it's an end to end end to end thing that's kind of fun, and it's something that I think uh, if you can do this, and I think everyone here can. Um, then you can do a heck of a lot more with uh, connected things. This is sort of like the, the base, and um, from here the sky's the limit. And, and I'm going to talk about how to sort of make that possible. Uh, as I mentioned, um, so Wilderness Labs uh, purchased Netuino um, from Secret Labs. Uh, their Secret Labs had, you know, an unfortunate set of business circumstances that uh, basically made them insolvent. Uh, not related to Netduino, um, but related to other things, other endeavors that they were trying to do. And um, Chris Walker, a friend of mine, uh, you know, we, we would catch up from time to time, and uh, he, he said to me, you know, I think I'm going to have to get rid of uh, uh, Netduino, sell it off, um, or, you know, uh, kill it entirely. And, and that sort of broke my heart because I have loved Netduino since it, it came out. Um, I've always been on the sort of cutting edge of of computing and trying new things and whatnot. And I really love the Netduino. You know, the idea that you could write uh, microcontroller apps using uh, modern, you know, a, a fairly modern framework, .NET micro framework, uh, and, and you know, connect it up in, 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 into uh, uh, a hardware platform that supports a lot of different things. You know, if you, you buy a sensor off of Adafruit or, or SparkFun or whatever, you know, you can you can throw it on the the Netduino. It's you know, it's got some really uh, great things about it. it. It's very low power. You can run it off of a solar panel. Uh, it's got built-in analog input. So all of your sensors, you can run directly. You don't have to go out and get a breakout board as you would with like um, Raspberry Pi or something. Uh, and I think it's just a fantastic, fantastic platform. Um, so not wanting to see this, not wanting to see Netduino uh, go away, I, I, purchased, I purchased it and um, started to build a kind of a company around it. And, and so now we've been around for, uh, we, we relaunched Netduino back in March, uh, and now we're sort of reigniting the community and, and you know, getting things rolling again and, and sort of uh, hoping that, that we can get folks out there playing with them again. And, 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 and this time, you know, kind of building real things and, and having a lot of fun prototyping. And, and we're making investments in things that never really, that never happened before with uh, Netduino. So, one of the things that we're going to launch uh, very soon is a is a massive uh, library of, of drivers for peripherals, uh, such as sensors and LCD screens and and hardware buttons and all kinds of sort of things like that to make um, Netduino development much much easier. So no longer do you have to go and put on your hardware hat if you buy an LCD screen and um, hack it together. You can simply plug it in and download uh, the driver from NuGet and and be up and running. And so. There's a lot of things that we're doing with Netduino that I think are really going to improve um, uh, the lives of, of developers and makers and folks who, who want to play with hardware. Uh, we've also uh, made tremendous investments already in documentation. Um, uh, I'll show you a bit of that later or in, in a second here. And um, we're, we're really working on developer enablement. So this is kind of part of that. Uh, we're also actively, like I said, uh, we're working on Netduino. We're trying to uh, fix some of the fix some of the outstanding bugs and make it a, a much more solid platform. We've launched um, full Mac support, so there's fidelity between 
uh, Windows and, and Mac. So for those of you that, that like to run Mac, then it's no longer, you know, it's no longer a, a decision, do I have to go to Windows? It's, it's either or now, and, and, and even Linux is now possible. Uh, and then, of course, we've open sourced pretty much everything that we've done. So we can, if, if you find an issue or you want to extend some of the tooling and, and whatnot, it's all there for you. Uh, this is developer.wildernesslabs.co. This is our, our developer portal. As you can see, it's got uh, a fantastic content. Um, we're still in the very early stages. Uh, I started uh, Wilderness Labs in kind of December, January timeframe. Um, so uh, we're, we're, we're pushing hard on that. Um, uh, and there's a, there's a ton of great stuff up there. There's uh, not just Netduino specific stuff, but also we've been publishing a, uh, an electronics tutorial that's aimed at uh, folks that, are, that are, are fresh to the hardware world, fresh to electronics. Um, but it takes a much more practical approach than, uh, say, grabbing an EE textbook from, uh, you know, from, from Powell's or something. Uh, we really integrate with uh, the kind of modern idea of electronics, so you jump right into the microcontroller pretty quickly and, and stuff. Uh, so check that out when you get a chance. Uh, and then, of course, we're at a community <coughs> site. We, we launched um, a, a great new forum site, and there's, if you're, if you're uh, doing... Uh, if you're, if you're you know, playing with Netduino and doing this, doing this uh, sort of development and you run into an issue, uh, you know, then there's tons of folks up there that are active and, and ready to help you. Um, we have a very friendly environment. And um, uh, also, if you just want to collaborate and talk to people, it's a, it's a great place as well. Uh, so with, uh, with that said, you know, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, the, on, the, saw, on the cell there. Um, uh, let's jump in to actually see how I put all this together because I, I think it's I think it's pretty fun and interesting. So the first part uh, of this whole solution is actually controlling the power of a coffee maker. And to do that, what I've what I've used is. Um, and you can see that I think this actually this has a, like a beam. All right, fancy. So uh, so up here you can see this is uh, this is a picture of what I've got sitting next to the, the coffee pot there. Um, this is what I call the appliance control board, and uh, this is a three D printable plastic base with some holes in it that you can uh, find at our our three uh, D printing uh, repo. And I'll uh, I'll make this uh, slide deck available later, so you can just click on all these links. Uh, and then the assembly uh, is actually also documented on our blog. So blog.wildernesslabs.co has uh, has all the all the parts. You can buy all these things off of all these parts off of Amazon. It's you can make this whole thing for very cheap. Um, I think it's probably like 15 bucks to get the breadboard, these uh, the power connects, um, uh, bus bars, and this relay. And then everyone, I'm sure, has one of these uh, five volt uh, uh, USB adapters floating around. If you don't go to the you know the gas station and they'll sell you one for buck twenty five or whatever, um, it won't be real high quality, but it'll work. It'll work. It'll power an Arduino. Uh, so this is really easy. To, really easy to build. And uh, the the heart of this is is really two things. There's uh, the Arduino and there's this relay uh, this relay board here. And uh, a relay uh, is, is actually very interesting. It's an electromechanical switch. Uh, so inside the relay is, uh, is a, 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 like a solenoid or a magnetized um, actuator. And, and what that does is that you can control large amounts or uh, different types of electricity with a very small amount of electricity. So uh, conceptually, you can think of this as like a transistor, except um, in, in the case of a relay, uh, it's, it's, it's electromechanical, and the two set, uh, circuits are completely separate. So in this case, I've got a three volt. I'm, I'm powering this, this switch here with three volts of electricity, and I'm controlling household 110, or you know you could do 240. Uh, and there's, there's uh, uh, if you're in Europe, um, and uh, there's relays out there that control massive amounts of, of power with very small, very small uh, uh, amounts of power. And uh, relays are very, very cheap. Uh, they're very safe. They're, they're you know, enclosed and they're, they're reliable. Um, and they're very easy to work with. This, 
Uh, this key studio board, I think, uh, costs like maybe seven dollars, and it has all of the electronics uh, built in to run these relays. Now, if you are using a relay on itself, on by its by its own, um, there are some uh, there are some characteristics of of the there's some electrical characteristics that you have to be concerned about um, with uh, feedback when you throw the switch and whatnot, and so. There's a there's a, a set of uh, uh, necessary components to sort of run a relay safely, and this keys board uh, encapsulates all those things uh, for you. So the only inputs here that we care about are ground and power to actually um, run the relay uh, switches, and then um, there's two digital inputs, uh, and so uh, each one of those inputs will run. Uh, the channel here, the, the, each one of these relays is considered a channel. And uh, from the .NET Micro Framework code to power this relay then, to switch one of these relays, all you have to do is you create an output port which uh, represents one of these digital I.O. pins. And uh, you, you, so you create your output port um, of the pin that you want, in this case it's pin 2. Um, and that's sort of an arbitrary decision. It could be pin, you know, seven or eight. It doesn't really matter. It's whatever you got plugged in here to, uh, to your relay. And then when you're ready to turn it on, you write to the port and you pull it high. So you add, you give it three volts. Uh, and so in this case, it takes a Boolean, true or false, or you could pass in a one um, for high. And that's it. That, that, uh, that's how you can turn on um, and control uh, this uh, your household electricity so very very simply with two lines of code you can see that that um, you can do all kinds of interesting things with with electricity here uh, from a net we know uh, will you swap will you switch to the um, github screen real fast <clears throat> por favor fantastic um, we click on connected coffee maker please so this is this is where actually where you can find the code. It's github.com slash wilderness labs. Um, and it's in Netuino samples. Uh, and then connected coffee maker. And then click on uh, uh, connected coffee simple control. Do we, does this show the readme um, page? Uh, the readme in the root of the readme? No, the readme on that, uh, in that, uh, in that, that uh, project forward that you're, you got selected. Mm -hmm. I don't see a read mm. You can open the next folder. Next folder down. <coughs> There's mm. a readme in the file first. Interesting. Okay, um, grab the program CS on uh, connected copy simple control. So this is, this is uh, the basic control program uh, that I was kind of showing you up on this slide deck. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here it is, I'm, uh, this is the entirety, and I just want to show you this because this is the entirety of the Netduino app that if you want to just turn on the relay, turn the relay on and off. Uh, so here it is, it's, uh, it, you know, for, this should look very familiar to everyone here. This is real simple C-sharp. Uh, like I said, I'm creating an output port, and then I'm just simply writing to the port. I'm waiting five seconds and then I'm turning it off. So this is just alternating back and forth. Uh, <coughs> And so I just wanted to show you that this was, uh, this is what a Netuino uh, program looks like. Uh, can you pop back over to the slide deck, please? All right. So the so that's fantastic. So uh, the first part when I was building this is like, okay, I just need to get this relay working. I just need to test this, you know, test the, the wiring and make sure that I can control this and that it's actually doing the things that I want it to do. Um, the next thing that we wanted to do was expose an API uh, on the Netduino um, so that we can, we can control it remotely. And we could do this a number of different ways. I could put a Bluetooth uh, module on the side and I could talk to it via Bluetooth or or, um, or I could I could talk to it over serial. Uh, I could connect it, you know, uh, with a wire, etc. But I thought, you know, I've got these nice nest net to with N3 Wi-Fi's. Uh, why not simply make a Wi-Fi enabled uh, uh, appliance control? Very simple. And uh, so we needed a we needed a web server. 
Um, and in this case, in this sample, right now we're using uh, Neon Mica. Oops. And uh, Neon Mica is a, a web server that was designed for Netduino um, some years back. And uh, it's, it's very good for doing very quick uh, prototyping. And so in our case, it, it required very, very little code um, to actually uh, expose an API that we could, that we could call and, and automatically wire up. Um, it does its own pin management. So, so it has the concept of your uh, GPIO or general purpose IO. It, uh, it's part of the, part of the web server. Um, so this made it very easy for us to uh, to expose an, an API um, without doing much, you know, do, doing much work. Uh, I think long term, uh, this was this is sort of V1 of this, and I think the next thing that we're going to do is uh, in the next couple of weeks we're going to we're going to change this to uh, this Rinsen uh, web server, which is also a uh, a native. Uh, Netduino uh, uh, .NET Micro Framework designed web server, but it has like kind of a more of a standard uh, a web API uh, 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 feel to it, and it, you know, it, it has um, uh, uh, built-in JSON and and um, you know, very easy routing and stuff. And, and, but the the downside there's there's a, it's a little bit more manual for controlling uh, your 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 I/O, uh, but you get a lot more flexibility. Uh, so, the, like I said, the next version of this will probably will probably move to a, a web server. But just to get it up and running uh, quickly, Neon Mica was was fantastic. And so here you can see these are our, our three uh, calls that we have in the web server that we've actually uh, wired up <coughs> right here. These are our res our uh, request and response uh, uh, wirings. Uh, status turn on turn off. So status just returns. Uh, whether or not um, the we we at, we're, we set a boolean um, it is toggled on, and so it, it just tells you whether or not the um, whether or not the the uh, coffee maker is on, the relay is on, uh, and then of course turn on turn off is pretty simple as well, uh, and and should be obvious. Uh, if you can pop back over to GitHub, that'd be fantastic. Okay, um, will you pop out of this and then um, in a, uh, scroll up, I think. Appliance host source, appliance host, uh, program.cs. And so this is, uh, this is, the, this is the app um, that we're running right now that uh, you have to scroll down just a little bit. Okay, uh, so this is, you saw this before, this is, uh, um, uh, where we wired up our web server, and then down here are our handler handlers. Uh, can you scroll down to the status turn on? So these are actually what's called um, when those requests are made. And as you can see here, it's very simple. Um, so we're we're first of all we're turning on the onboard LED uh, just to show you just to, as a more of a debug output uh, than anything. So on the uh, Netduino itself, there's a built-in onboard LED that's blue, and so when I when I hit the when I smash the button and I turn on the relay, I also turn on that LED, so we we know that it's it's working if other things fail. And then, uh, like I said, this uh, web server has this concept of of, of inherent or, or intrinsic pin management, and um, we when we want to turn it on, we simply set the digital pin state. Uh, and we say what number, what pin it is. In this case, it's on pin one, which is the second pin on there. Uh, and then whether or not it's toggled on. It's very, very, very simple. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. And the rest of the code here on the, on the right is actually um, the networking code uh, to, uh, and this is, this is up in, um, this is actually up on the docs and in as samples. This is a copy paste uh, that we hope to put in the, into a library at some point. Uh, the Netduino is a, a mini computer, so um, unlike uh, uh, if you're writing an application that's running in, in a, on a desktop or in a mobile, in which the network's already initialized, etc. Um, in Netduino, when you run your application, you actually, as part of it, you have to initialize the network. You have to wait for an IP. Um, you have to wait for you know your DHCP stuff, etc. So that's what that other stuff is. But uh, that stuff is is very uh, rarely ever needing to needed to be uh, modified. So I think we're gonna we're gonna try to sort of libraryify that. Uh, can you pop back over to the? Does the web server also realize an inline code, or is that a library? 
the it's a good question. Uh, right now, we've just uh, it's uh, they're separate projects, and we're just building against the projects. But uh, we're also putting it up in a in a new get right now, so you just be able to new get package it. And that's true, um, not just for Neon Mica, but the Rinsen web server we're new getizing as well. We're doing we're sort of uh, this big push right now that. Uh, to, uh, to launch this this new new sort of library system, where we've taken a lot of that uh, the a lot of the common uh, things that you need to do and, and drivers and stuff, and putting them up in NuGet so that it's more of a modern experience. You don't have to go and grab code, and copy paste, uh, um, and uh, so that's a, that's something that we're working on right now. Uh, the final thing here, the uh, final piece of this, of course, is the Xamarin uh, mobile app. Uh, how many people here have developed in Xamarin before? About 30 of you. All right, all right. Um, so uh, how many people actually, uh, out of curiosity, how many uh, of you know about Xamarin or what Xamarin is? It's nearly everyone, nearly everyone. For, so the, for the few remaining <coughs> folks, um, Xamarin is, is, a, is a mobile platform that allows you to write um, mobile apps, tar native mobile apps targeting iOS, Android, and Windows uh, in C Sharp. And uh, it's, it's really fantastic because it, you can use a single code base and, um, and, and target these, di these different uh, platforms with minor, uh, oftentimes just minor UI uh, tweaks across, across them. Um, so it's, it's really fantastic. So the, uh, the mobile app, uh, you don't want to spend too much time in it, uh, but it's it's pretty basic. It's just a Xamarin Forms app, so it should run in an Android and and as well as iOS and, and whatever uh, Windows devices is alive out there. I'm not really even sure what the story is there anymore <laughs> for Windows. Um, <coughs> they, I, I think it runs on uh, like a, the Surface Pro tablets and stuff like that. I don't know. Does anyone have a mobile Windows mobile phone here? Just out of curiosity. Yeah. Not with you have one still. <laughs> I'm not with you. You like a coaster? That's, that's <laughs> really? Wow. That's uh, well. You know what? This this this. You should try to deploy the mobile app. I'd be interested to know if it works. <laughs> right. Uh, so the mobile app, uh, like I said, it's a Xamarin Forms app. So it runs across the different uh, different stuff, and it's. Uh, uh, a very simple, uh, the, the, the code is, is, is very simple. Um, this is uh, our, our power command. Um, so this is where we're, we're, we're telling, uh, uh, this is where we're actually uh, just making a request, a web request to the, um, to the, to the web server. Pretty, it's pretty, pretty simple. We're, you know, we're noodling up a, a, a web request. We're, 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 to, we're putting in the host address and then our API call, which could be you know turn on, turn off status, uh, not not super, not super magical stuff here. Um, and then uh, of course we're returning uh, success. Uh, so that's 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 it for the mobile app. Um, if you pop back over to GitHub, I can uh, I'll do a, a, just a real quick, just a real quick um, uh, kind of uh, show of what's on there. So um, appliance remote, that's what we want. So if you expand the source. So the, the way that the mobile app is set up is, um, for those of you uh, that are familiar with Xamarin Forms, this is, uh, this is all pretty uh, basic. But uh, so here we have our core um, appliance remote is the core code. Uh, and that's basically actually all of the code for the app. There's, there's almost nothing in Droid or iOS. Those are simply the projects that get built and deployed. So uh, if you expand um, appliance remote views here, so these are the actual uh, view pages. We only have two. We have a status page, uh, which is, uh, just shows you whether or not the appliance is turned on, and uh, then uh, a configure page, which allows you to enter an IP. And they're just simple, uh, very simple XAML. Um, and then if you click on uh, app XAML CS, I think it is. So here's, that's not it. Um, I apologize. It is uh, API helper. Yeah, and then so uh, if you if you pull this code down, you, you'll see API helper. This is actually where you'll find 
um, the code to uh, call the web server. And, and uh, as we saw before, it's, just, it's, it's pretty easy, it's pretty basic, it's pretty, pretty easy to follow. Uh, so that's, that's really it. Um, will you pop back over to uh, the presentation, please? Question? Yeah, far away. Uh, do you implement the standard system.net if I want to do UDP and TCP <coughs> uh, IO and then secondly, uh, is, do you know if there's a ZMQ port which would sit on, which there's a .NET ZMQ, but can it run on this? Um, so the first part was, uh, do you implement uh, standard system.net? So .NET microframework is a, is a subset of the full uh, .NET experience. Um, there is system.net and it does have uh, extensive UDP, TCP, IP stack. Um, but there are some things that are minorly different. Um, the other thing was the, was the .NET, was the Z what? ZMQ. ZMQ. I've never actually even heard of that, so I don't know what it is. Can you? It's a, it's a messaging, publish, subscribe messaging, like Rabbit and Q. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It's a little lighter weight than some of the uh, pubs up. I don't, I don't know if that'll run on it. I, 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 I don't know, honestly. Um, it might, but I can't guarantee that. It's been a long time since I looked at the message queuing stuff and done that. <clears throat> so, uh, now that you understand, uh, you know how to put this together, and, and um, you know kind of got a walkthrough of the code. There's, you know, if you want to try this at home, it's very easy. Uh, like I said, all the code is uh, is linked up there. Um, instructions on how to build the appliance control board. Um, you can you can 3D print the base, or you can have a friend 3D print it, or you can go to ADX Portland, um, your local hack shop, and get them to print it and then the, 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 the components are you know 20 bucks or whatever there's all kinds of things that I think that would be fun to do to expand on this um, some ideas that we were kicking around is, is that you could you know you could set a timer so that the copy pots only ever on for uh, a certain amount of time or you could uh, um, you know put you could start to integrate sensors which is one of the, I think the next things that we'll, we'll show is okay so now Let's get some sensor data and let's do a feedback loop. So let's say, you know, let's control how hot your, your copy gets. So maybe in your mobile app, maybe you don't want, you don't want McDonald's, uh, you don't want a McDonald's <coughs> level of copy. Maybe you want, you know, the, the, the corner barista level. So, uh, you know, maybe we'll ratchet it down a bit and, and make sure it never gets too hot. Uh, and then of course you could add push notifications. So when your coffee's done, you, you get notified on your, on your app. Or you could do a scheduler. You know, you could uh, you could schedule your coffee in the morning or, or, or whatnot. There's all kinds of ideas here. So I encourage everyone to um, download uh, download the, the 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 code and and um, start playing with it and and uh, you know have fun like hacking on this stuff. This is the reason why I bought it. Doing the reason why I'm doing this is because I think this stuff is a blast. I've always thought that man, hardware is so cool. Um, and and it, for forever it's been so difficult, so hard. But you know, it doesn't have to be. It really doesn't have to be. And, and we're really trying to demystify that and uh, you know enable folks to actually do things. And so this is what you're seeing here is the is the very very early days of of uh, Wilderness Labs and, and and what we have in store. Um, so how many people here have a NetDuino? I you have a NetDuino with you, <laughs> which is fantastic. How many people here have a have a NetDuino someplace? One, yeah. Couple of a couple of NetDuino's floating through a few. How much? How much are they? Oh, um, the the Wi-Fi model. This is the like the super high end. I think is sixty nine bucks. Um, and then the you can get like a NetDuino two for thirty bucks, but it doesn't have um, Ethernet or, or Wi-Fi. And then there's there's sort of like a set of, set of models in between as well. I think you can get a, an Ethernet and two for I think it's like thirty five bucks. Um, and that's it's called N2 Plus, and that's a really powerful, nice little machine. How reliable is it? Um, well, that's a good question. Uh, you know, from a development standpoint, some of the tooling, uh, I'm, I'm not going to lie, some of the tooling is a little flaky right now. We're working through some of those issues, especially on Mac, you know, because that's a new support that we added. But in terms of the actual hardware, the hardware is incredibly reliable. Um, 
Nintowino, uh, as I'm learning, has actually been used. A lot of folks have built products with this um, that they've you know, used industrial um, solutions that have been running on Netuino and running on Netuinos for years, uh, which you know blows my mind. But they are. I mean, it is very. It, it does seem to be very reliable. Um, one of the one of the benefits that it has, and one of the things that it gets its reliability from, is is the fact that you're writing .NET apps and you've got a garbage collector and you know you're not you're not accruing uh, memory errors over time and whatnot. So a lot of things that are that sort of you have to think about if you're if you're if you're using uh, a low-level languages, you know, we've sort of taken care of those in you know more modern framework. Yeah. The dev environment does it compile the native um, code and what's you run a compiler on a Mac or PC, or what? what uh, so, so, so the way that works. So the question was, you know, the development environment does when you when you compile an app in Netuino, does it go to go to native native code? Um, Netuino is actually really interesting because it runs a .NET interpreter. So um, it has a little operating system on there called Tiny Tiny um, a Tiny CLR, and it's that's written in C C plus plus. And uh, it, you compile an application to IL, and then there's a metadata processor which strips out a, a, a lot of stuff and then ships that IL and runs that application interpreted. So it's actually running an interpreted, uh, an interpreted app. I think the next generation of this is something we're going to go, you know, it'll be full AOT compiled. Um, but uh, right now it's, it's got a, a, a little fun interpreter. And you were next, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just kind of curious uh, about the hardware, like the next gen. What, what are your guys' plans? Um, well, uh, and most of those I'd like to keep under wraps, <laughs> of course. Um, Can go small version or anything like that? Yes, uh, we'll absolutely have. The next gen will have, we'll, we'll do an embeddable, uh, an embeddable piece of hardware. Um, there's, a, there's, a ton of, there's a ton of uh, requests for that. There's a ton of need. Um, for an embeddable piece of hardware, because people want to, they want to go from prototype to production without having to rewrite their app, without you know having to retarget things, and so that's absolutely a goal for us. Um, and you know, generally, in terms of hardware, I can say that that the the next generation will be um, even smarter. Really, actually, kind of magical. We're doing some things around like power consumption, where we have power rails that we can turn peripherals off when you're not using them and uh, we can power up RAM and unpower RAM or you can use part of the RAM and put the rest to sleep. Uh, so we're doing a lot of stuff uh, that's pretty innovative around power features and also security. Uh, so um, the next wave of, of hardware will be rather interesting. And we're also making, you know, our plan here is that we'll have a, a compatibility layer so that while you're able to write full .NET standard uh, 2 applications, you'll be able to take all your Nintendo work um, and and just run it on on the new hardware as well. So so you know don't let don't wait for the the new stuff. It'll, it'll, it'll still be a while. Um, and anything you write now today will will we'll port very easily. That's that's a, a, a like a real priority for us. And you were next. Um, looking at the net windows, they have pretty limited flash space and memory space. Yes. How, does that, how do you manage that when you're developing your code in your IDE or Visual Studio? Yeah, that's right. So um, uh, the the point was that um, this is embedded hardware. This is uh, a microcontroller, and it has you know you don't have gobs of, of RAM, you don't have gobs of flash, um, and so uh, there are considerations to uh, managing that. Uh, so there's a number of things that that, that folks do. You'll find uh, first of all, you'll find that the the tiny CLR and um, the .NET Micro framework is very 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 uh, uh, trim. It's, there's not a lot of fat in there. And so um, you rarely run into issues where you have code space um, problems. In fact, I've never actually run into that, but I know that, that, that folks do. The, the N3 has, uh, I think, a meg and a half or so of, of code space. And so uh, it's really hard on a microcontroller application to run out of a space with that. Now, storage uh, is another is another consideration, um, and so uh, the the in three of the models, the N, uh, the N3 Ethernet, N3 Wi-Fi, and N2 Plus all come with uh, onboard SD um, storage, and you can uh, 
you can address up to two gigabytes of uh, storage. And so um, uh, a lot of folks that need storage space, uh, you know, they, they will persist. If you're doing some, you know, memory intensive things, you can persist and it's a little slower, but you, then you get up to two gigs and then, and then you also have persistent storage. So it becomes like a hard drive as well. Um, and, and <coughs> so the tools, when you compile, it tells you, um, it tells you uh, what size the code is. Uh, so you know immediately um, when you deploy, it says, you know, deploying 86, you know, thousand bytes or whatever. And then um, there are some tools to see RAM usage, but I don't recall how to use them or what they are off the top of my head. It's a good question. I, I'll, I'll, I should, I'll dig into that. You had a, a question. Uh, you mentioned the uh, take analog, analog ports on it. Can you plug a normal directly to that? Or? So, um, it, so he said. The, the question was, how, can you um, directly um, do a thermal coupler into this uh, the sensor into the analog ports? Um, the question is, yes, with a resistor, and and the reason why is because uh, those um, resistive. So he's talking about resistive sensors, and a resistive sensor is a, a sensor like a photoresistor or a therm or a therm a thermoresistor uh, that vary the resistance, the impedance of electricity through them depending on whatever they are sensing, whatever in external input, so whether it be temperature or light, um, the, uh, the uh, resistor may, for example, when it gets, if it gets a lot of light, it may let electricity through very easily, and if not a lot of light, then it may have a high resistance. And there's no way to measure resistance directly on a net you, know, you can you can measure voltage. And so all you have to do is you add a resistor in series with the um, with your thermocoupler or your therm resistor and then you uh, from this from in between those you hook that up to your analog in and that's called a voltage divider and uh, what that does is that converts your resistance into a uh, voltage that you can read. It's very, very simple to do. And actually I'm about to publish um, Part five of our electronics tutorial, which covers that in, in depth. Um, it's very, very simple. Uh, it's like I said, it takes one resistor and uh, the, the, um, the calculation on that is also very, very simple. You, you simply take your, uh, the, the max uh, resistance of your thermal resistor or your, your photoresistor, let's say it's 100K, <coughs> and you, t you add a resistor that's half the value of that one. So you just add a 50K ohm resistor hook it up to the analog input and it's done. It's very, very simple. So hopefully that's a long-winded explanation, but uh, yeah, you can hook it up very easily. Uh, and almost all sensors are uh, analog input, though few resistors are uh, resistive, or sorry, few sensors are resistive sensors. Most sensors uh, give a variable voltage out and then you just read that directly. It's a good question. Uh, back in the back. Um, so what's the difference between the Arduino and the Netduino? It's a good question. Uh, so what's the what's the difference between the Arduino and the Netduino? Um, well, the main difference is that uh, the Netduino runs .NET micro framework. Uh, that's that's the big difference. You can't run uh, .NET on an Arduino. Um, the other thing is that uh, the the Netduino is a, is a far more powerful um, uh, microcontroller and board. Uh, than Arduino, um, although you can now get very powerful Arduinos these days. The, the base level Arduinos are, 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 are more toys than anything. Um, this so you have a completely different uh, developer experience. So in Arduino, you're, you're writing uh, C to C++, and a language actually called wiring, which is uh, C++ without headers, uh, header files. Um, so it, it's really a it's a, it's really a, a framework a language uh, choice. So C sharp or, or C plus is your is your decision there. So, um, is there uh, any ideas of having a mini board for Arduino? Yes. Um, so so uh, the question is there is there an idea for a mini board for Arduino? Yeah. Um, we, that was what I was saying earlier is that we want to build an embeddable an embeddable version of uh, what you could what uh, what you could call a spiritual successor in uh, uh, like an N4, um, which is what we're developing right now. 
and that will have an embeddable mini version. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. I meant MIDI. Oh, MIDI. Um, actually, you can do MIDI on um, NetDuino. It's really funny that you asked that uh, because on the community forums, I think it was last week or the week before someone was um, talking about MIDI and there was a couple of folks that were posting code and ideas and whatnot to do uh, MIDI control. And so it's, it's absolutely possible. Um, I don't think there's a lot of libraries out there right now, but if you're interested, you should hop on the, on the forums and see what folks are, are talking about and what they're doing there. Yeah, and then uh, in mustache. Uh, in, in within Arduino, you have a sketch that you have to write the control for those and whatnot. Does, yeah. Does, a, does this have that, and or or the library that this library going to have that flexibility that the sketch has? In it? So, um, in in Arduino, a sketch is their idea, their concept of an app. Um, and so what you saw earlier with the, with that micro framework app that was you know just a few lines that, that uh, did the control, that, that would be the Netuino equivalent of Sketch. It's just a .NET micro framework application that runs on Netuino. And then just in front of you, fine. Yeah, what's, what are the uh, latencies and timing performance characteristics and variability like to do near real time stuff? Um, I, I, you know, I can't answer that off the top of my head. Uh, there is, uh, on the, in our developer portal, there are uh, some, uh, some specs there, but the real details are in the data sheet of the microcontroller. Um, the, I think the, like for example, and it just depends on what you're asking, like uh, PWM generation, I think is uh, like 10 kilohertz or something, or megahertz, I, I think it's very fast. Um, uh, but I I can't I couldn't give uh, I couldn't give any like useful specs off the top of my head. But I can tell you that a lot of people do real time industrial control uh, systems with them without issue. They are it is it's the 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 Nintendo Windows three series in particular is built off of the um, uh, STM thirty two F four chip, which is a very fast. It's one hundred sixty eight megahertz uh, microcontroller and um, the uh, there's very little um, there's little, very little between that and the I/O ports. So you're basically you basically limited to what the chip is. Okay. Now we're here. Um, PWM uh, standard uh, RC hobby uh, servos. Yes. Uh, examples uh, mm -hmm. given the controllers. Yes, absolutely. So the question is, I want to work with it. I want to work with the servo. Um, servo are servos are um, little motors that are very, very um, accurate. You know, you can say rotate seventy four and a half degrees, and the way that you do that is through this thing called PWM generation. And PWM is uh, pulse width modulation. And pulse width modulation is is the idea that instead of just turning, we saw a, a, a digital I/O pin. Instead of just turning it on to three three point three volts and letting it just sit there high and, and provide a continuous signal. Um, pulse width modulation says, you know what I want to do is I want to, I want to, I want to turn that on uh, and off very fast so that it's on and off at 50% of the time. And so basically instead of having 3.3 uh, volts, you're now at uh, 1.6 uh, volts or, or whatever, so 1.6 and a half. Um, and so uh, there's also, there's lots of, fun stuff you can do with um, PWM. In, uh, in, instead of just doing uh, like just a, a half time, half duration, 50%, you can actually map it across other functions. So you can map it to a sine wave and you can generate like, uh, you know, you can generate a sine, uh, like, a, like an alternating current signal, etc. And this is how you control uh, a number of different uh, things. Uh, such as uh, servos, and um, so the question is: Is there libraries that make, we make it easy? And the answer is absolutely. Um, there's a ton of uh, libraries out there uh, to control servos, and we just actually um, we just put together a really nice library uh, for servo control, and that's going to launch with our Netduino Foundation stuff. How many servos could you control from the basic Netduino? There, I think, are. 
I think it's either six or nine um, hardware PWM generators. Um, so those are the ones where you can generate uh, uh, by just simply newing up a PWM object and assigning it to one of the pins. Um, but you can also generate uh, a PWM, uh, you can do a software PWM signal, which means that in your um, application, you can actually cycle the, uh, you can cycle the pin uh, on and off, and you can, you can, again, you can apply function to it, so you can apply a sign or whatever. And um, it, it's, it's, it's very fast and very clean. I think it's I, I, it, software, I can't remember off the, hand, off the top of my head um, what we were able to do, but from a software uh, generation standpoint, we were still able to very high uh, uh, frequency PWMs. So, so PWM, you can control a lot of servos is, I guess, the, the short answer. Six or nine native hardware and then more via software. And then, of course, you can, you can mesh Netduinos together and, uh, you know, and, and you can use them as, as uh, sort of, uh, you know, limb brains if you want. If you're building, like, some sort of complex robot, you could have a, a Netduino that, that sent out, you know, overall control signals, and then you could use multiple Netduinos. Uh, you could use, like, very cheap Netduinos, like N2 or something at, at, at 30 bucks. Manipulator or something. That's right. That's right. So you could, you know, you could do lots of, that's actually how insects work. You know, they have this sort of external, they've externalized their, their processing into their limbs and stuff. So. Open source? Is yes. Uh, Netuino is entirely open source. It's a license. I think we licensed it under MIT or Apache. You know, they're good ones. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a very permissive license. The designs are up there on our repo. Um, the SDK is, is all open source, so you can go and hack, hack on things there. Um, all of our tooling we've open sourced, even like our new med our uh, Mac support, we like the Mac tooling and stuff. So everything's everything's open source. So I hack away and expand and fix bugs. <laughs> you know, the question was actually the same question. Ah, that was one of the things that we did um, when we took over Netuino was we made sure that it was. It wasn't just open source in name, it was really actually open source. All the source was there. You could, you could build it, you could build the source. It wasn't missing you know, key stuff. And um, it was a proper permissive license. So I think we chose Apache too, but it might be MIT. But there's honestly, at this point, there's functionally little difference between Apache 2 and MIT. You know, I'll so take advantage of my question. Yeah, fire away. So uh, is it? Is it possible or even within license? I mean, an obvious question would be is, uh, what about NetDuino support on Pi 3, for instance? I would think that all the framework is there, just be in the compiler, I presume. It, 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 wouldn't, it wouldn't work. Um, and the reason is is that, uh, I mean, it, it would work with a lot of, a lot of work, a lot of porting. Um, the Raspberry Pi is really just a, I mean, it's a little Linux computer. Um, you know, it runs Windows, obviously, but you know, at this point, it's, it's a, it runs a, a, a real full operating system. And it doesn't have um, any built-in analog um, ports, so you, you there would almost be no point in um, porting .NET Microframework to Raspberry Pi um, because you lose out on half of the functionality. Or, you know, really, the point of microcontrollers here, which is, you know, how do I run sensors and things? I need the analog I/O. Well, yeah. But Raspberry Pi runs Windows 10. Yes, that's right. Key mode, my question is going to be, for what level of compatibility um, do you guys have with that? Or would you, or would you consider trying to, let's say, like compatibility with um, your little, um, um, you know, you write a library that runs a uh, TFT display, for example, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And you know, I would hope that, you know, in a, in a perfect world, that if you can have the same library we're going to Windows IoT device. Yeah, I think it would be close. Um, and it would still be it would still be a, a port. It's simply because the .NET Micro Framework has a slightly different surface area and and, and exposes things a little bit differently. You, you know, you're talking about an FBI bot or an yeah, or simple stuff like that will just uh, is almost 100% fidelity. That's right. So if you're doing an I squared C um, uh, a peripheral, then the code will you know might have some minor tweaks. Yeah. But otherwise, you know, you, you can solve those with some if defines, some pound defines. So in that sense, yeah, it's pretty affordable. Uh, right here. 
Analog I/O, can you read the whole five volt range, or what's what's the range of the analog? It's it's zero to three three, uh, but five five volt tolerant, um, and you can uh, you can you can read five volt uh, sensors, although there are hardly any left um, because most most things have moved to the three three um, voltage, uh, but you can read a five volt sensor with a very simple uh, voltage divider. Actually, again, so. Uh, two resistors that have 3.3 uh, over 5 ratio, and then you pull off from the center, and, and that's your that that divides your voltage down into the the 3.3 three range. Um, I think it was on, one up here, and then yeah. over here. Um, so there, I remember a couple of years ago there was a problem doing software serial, and they just didn't have pins. Has that been addressed? Um, Question was, I think there was a problem doing software serial over digital pins. I, you know, I kind of, I vaguely recall that, but I, I it's think. It's to do with the timing, like the timing serial getting in the way, messing it up. I, 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 I vaguely, I, I want to say, I think that was resolved in a, in a firmware update. But okay. if it's not, let us know, because we're actively, um, we're actively releasing new firmware uh, 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 versions, new releases, and, and I think that's something that we could we could probably fix pretty easily. And and if not, there's also hardware serial, of course. There's the there's right. SPI port and stuff. Um, so then I think over here. Yeah, you have a question. What's the uh, resolution of the analog pins? Uh, 12 bit, 12 bit ADC. Yeah, uh, so um, uh, 1,200 and one, oh, sorry, 1,024 steps. So, so the question is the resolution of the 12 volt. <coughs> or the, sorry, the, what was the resolution of the analog, uh, the digital controller? So, um, what that means is that if you're reading a voltage, it's either from zero to 3.3. What is the? How many steps do we divide that into? Um, uh, so, what resolution can you can you read that and? Uh, the answer is that it's a 12 bolt, a 12 bit ADC, um, which gives you. Uh, we divide that zero to 3.3 into 1,024 uh, steps. So it's. it's I th but I think that one of the bits is not is is. I don't think that. I think that. I don't know why it is that it's only 1,024. It's not 4096. So it, uh, it's I don't know why I don't know how the why the last two bits aren't aren't being used. The with the microcontroller it does the ADC is a 12 bit um, ADC but you're right the resolution is 10 bit I don't know why that is the ADC is so strange to me like um, it's it's so fascinating I was actually just reading how the ADC uh, works uh, yesterday because I'm writing a tutorial and it's. It's really, really fascinating, and, I, and I'm going to take this sojourn because it's going to take three minutes, and um, I think that that actually is really interesting. So, so what happens is that um, so here's your zero to three point three uh, uh, graph, and a signal comes in, and let's say it comes in at, at, at three volts. What happens is that it hits your ADC, and there's what we what they call a hold and uh, charge and hold capacitor, and so this. There's, there's, there's several of these analog pins, and each one of them has this charge and hold capacitor. And so what happens is that it, 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 it cycles through every single one of those pins, and each, each pin will charge up the capacitor to the same voltage level as the input. So this charge, this capacitor uh, might charge at three, three volts, and then if there's a signal on, on, on another pin, this capacitor will, will charge at like you know, two volts or whatever it is. And then there's um, there's a there's a, a multiplexer which uh, there's one ADC brain if you will and it cycles very fast through each one of these and it reads it pulls the charge off of the um, the charge and hold capacitor and then in this thing it it has a, it uses a binary search and it's got a comparator and so what it does is it starts with uh, so you have your you have your your 12 bits or uh, somehow magically 10 bits but whatever it, it starts with the most significant bit and it says um, it, it does a comparator between between uh, 0 and 3.3 .3. is it above or below the halfway point so it's a binary like I said it's a binary search and so the first significant bit it says okay it's for 3.0 it's going to be above so that's a 1 
And then it divides it in half again for the next significant bit. And it says, is it, is it, is it above or below um, whatever halfway in between, you know, 1.6 and 3.3 is. And, and, and so, it, you know, it, it uses a comparator again. And then it fills it. So it does this very fast. And it fills out each bit, each time getting it up like a more fine resolution. And then it converts that 12-bit uh, that that 12 bit uh, uh, storage somehow, I don't know, lo loses two bits somehow. I don't know what's happening. Uh, and then, um, you know, so, so it takes that and then, then, then that returns that digital value of whatever that input was. So that's how an ADC works, guys, folks. I know more than probably you wanted to know, but I think it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, far away. Very easy. Question is, how hard is it to um, get Bluetooth low energy working on it? Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. When I was at Xamarin, I built a little library called Monkey Robotics. And uh, Monkey Robotics has a driver in there for a Bluetooth uh, uh, module. And we were driving around uh, robots that we that were running Netuino um, and, and a Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth uh, uh, LE module. And we were driving them with our, uh, our Xamarin app. And so that whole thing is documented end to end up on Monkey Robotics. And there's, uh, there is a uh, Xamarin Bluetooth library as well uh, as part of that to make that really easy. Okay. So you can just grab that code to, if, you wanna, if you wanna write a Xamarin app to do it. Uh, it's super easy. The Bluetooth, uh, the Bluetooth modules are, most of them I think are serial. And so it's, it's four connections, it's power ground, and then serial, uh, transmit, serial, receive. And uh, it's a very, it's like a super easy protocol. And, and like I said, all that's, uh, it's actually well documented up on them. If you search for monkey robotics, you'll get the repo, and that will actually show you the wiring and stuff. It's, it's, it's super easy. Is there plan to add it to the next end? I, I, it's, I will say that it's uh, high on the list of considerations. Yeah, native Bluetooth. Um, I, at this point, I don't know why we wouldn't add it. Because it, Bluetooth now is very cheap and it's very easy to, to add. So uh, that, will pr that will probably be on it, natively. But you know, don't, don't hold my feet to the fire because you know, we're still very early on the hardware. <laughs> yeah, back here. Do you plan to make a bunch of shields for it? Uh, the question is, do we plan to make a bunch of shields? Um, probably not. We'll, we'll make a few. Um, I'd like to make uh, a relay. Uh, I'd like to make a relay board that's a little better. Um, one that has the bus bars already built in, for example. You know, things like I'd like to solve some some challenges that you run into that you know should just be done a little nicer. Um, we'll probably do a, a, a cellular. Um, uh, module and um, probably a software um, radio module so that you can run any of those the host of of, of radio protocols Zigbee wave uh, you know Laura Wara mesh this that you know make we'll, we really want to make that easy um, but I think a lot of the uh, modules are are probably best left to the community to to decide what they want to build and, and um, you know build on top of the platform. What about something like a ship register? Um, I don't know if it. We need to build our own uh, module for that, just because they're sort of cheap and out there and really easy to. And we actually have a driver for uh, several of them in uh, NetDuino Foundation. They're pretty easy to use. They're, you know, I don't, I don't know if it needs its own module, especially when they're just a, usually just a chip and, and you know, a couple of I.O. Not here. Are these uh, are the connectors uh, incompatible with existing kinds of shields? Yes, that's right. Uh, so our, so Netduino is shield compatible with Arduino um, shields. Uh, and I think probably 95, 98% of them work. Um, I think there's a few out there that are kind of known wonks that don't quite work um you know the driver availability is is usually pretty good for for them um but there's some out there that you probably have to write a driver for uh 
but yeah, it's it's generally Arduino shield compatible. The picture looked like there were three high density connectors uh, opposite the Ethernet port. What are those? High density connectors at opposite. Oh, that's uh, that's an Arduino Go um, port. Uh, I can actually show you. Yeah, so he's talking about these uh, connectors here. Uh, so there's a Netuino, Netuino Go connectors. Um, that's based on the, uh, the Gadgeteer, um, the uh, Gadgeteer standard that Microsoft had. And so it's, it's their Gadgeteer compatible and there's some Go modules. Um, but we're, we're discontinuing those. I, I, you know, like no one needs another proprietary connector. And, and, Thank you. And, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the last thing the world needs is another protocol, really. So they're there. They're there for legacy reasons. You can still buy Go modules. People still make Gadgeteer, some of the Gadgeteer models. Uh, modules you can plug them in and you can you can code away um, and they're they're nice uh, I just you know I I just don't think they're really needed cool any other questions fantastic that was a, that was a great Q&A uh, you have a lot of great questions Yeah, thanks, thanks for having me, and thanks for showing up tonight. And I hope yeah, everyone goes out and buys a, a net to we know. Because we, we use the sales. Great. <laughs> <laughs> right. What's uh, about what you got? Got it. Uh,